analysis of data, in particular Bayesian hierarchical models. So these are coming into cosmology increasingly. Uh, we applied for supernovae, we applied for weak lensing, large scale structure, and so on. And they can allow you to do some really quite sophisticated Bayesian analysis of, uh, of data. I want to motivate it by going back to a problem that we came across earlier uh, in the week, that is the number counts where we have a, a source that has uh, twice the flux of the twice the minimum flux. Um, so when we looked at it before, we assumed that the there was no error in the measurement of the flux. Now in reality there will be a, a, a measurement error. So how could we include that into the analysis? And we could do that with a Bayesian hierarchical model. Um, so we changed the problem slightly, but we have some error distribution. You can say there's some Gaussian error distribution on these uh, on the flux. So the way that we can do that is to introduce uh, a new extra variable, sometimes called the latent variable, uh, which is something which is unobservable, um, but which is relevant to the problem. Let's call it R, and R here is the uh, the true value of the flux. So we don't know what it is. We have an estimate of it from the measurement. But because of the measurement error, we don't know what it is. But let's introduce it into the analysis. And for each of the sources, then we could do this for every source. So let's call, it, call these R. And what we want out of this is to infer the distribution, the power law distribution for, uh, for the true fluxes. So actually, the model is not that n is proportional to the observed flux to minus alpha, but it's proportional to the true flux, because that's where the physics is. So we can build um, a Bayesian hierarchical model. In a sense, it's, it's common sense, but you know, you go through the procedure and then you can give it a fancy name, but it's basically just you know, a straightforward analysis. The, the way to start to do these things is to write down a forward model, sometimes called a generative model. In other words, if I wanted to simulate this process, what would I do? So you'd start by having drawing the slope of the distribution from some prior, P of alpha. So that gives us the value of alpha. We then specify what the probability distribution is, so this is the physical model that says that it's proportional to r to the minus alpha. You could then draw randomly from that distribution to give us one or more values of alpha, so the true values, true fluxes. And then once we've got the true fluxes, you would then add the noise. Okay, so we then bring in a, in this case, known variance, say, let's say it's a Gaussian noise. So we introduce sigma as a known error. And then that gives us, and we also need to know the, 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 the distribution of noise, so what's the probability of getting S given that the true value is R? So for example, a Gaussian with a width sigma. And then that will give us S. So this is one way to generate a flux, an observed flux. So we divide the problem into levels of the hierarchy, as it's called, starting from the thing that is what we want in the end, uh, and getting to the data at the bottom. So we have data at the bottom, and then the thing that we want to infer at the top, which is alpha. Now, one of the things that often makes this very effective, and it's true in this case, is that if you look at these levels of the hierarchy, then the top levels of the hierarchy have nothing to do with the measurement area. So those don't depend on sigma. And the bottom of the hierarchy here uh, has results that don't depend on alpha, they just depend on the measurement error. So we can hope that if by splitting up this you know, relatively complicated inference problem into these steps, the, the hope is, and indeed this is what happens in practice, is that many of these probability distributions become relatively simple. Um, and uh, in this case, it just splits into two parts where we have uh, parts independent of sigma and, and alpha. So you might like to try to write an expression for P of alpha given the observed value of x and given the information that, uh, that we've got on there. So yeah, that's something that you uh, should be able to do. 
What I want to do now is to give you a relatively simple example of a Bayesian hierarchical model and uh, go through it step by step and show how we, would, how we would solve it. And then after that, I'll give you some examples of the more complicated uh, Bayesian hierarchical models that we, that we use in practice. So let's just take a very simple problem and say that uh, we, we measure the x and y coordinates of a, of a point. And we have a model that says that, the, uh, that there's a straight line relationship between x and y. So what we want is the posterior for n. So rule one, write down what we want. So given the observed values of capital X and capital Y, what is the posterior probability for, for the slope n? How do we do this? Well, um, we use Bayes theorem, of course. Always the first step. Write it as a likelihood times a prior m. And now, because there are errors in x and y, then we introduce two latent variables which are the true values of x and y. So we call those little x and little y. Uh, so we introduce those into the problem. And we marginalize. So the likelihood of m given capital X and capital Y is the integral of the joint distribution of capital X, capital Y, little x, little y, given m, times the prior of m, integrated over x and y. Straightforward. And we can mess around with the probability, the joint probability we can write as a conditional probability given little x and y times the probability of x and y given n times the, times the prime. So this is all, I think, straightforward. I mean, it's all turned into a Bayesian hierarchical model, but it's just, uh, it just makes, makes sense. So here's the expression again. So now we get some simpli simplification because the errors on x and y, in this case, don't depend on n. So the first term here, we can drop the dependence on m and just write it as the probability of big X and big Y given little x and y. And those will write as Gaussians at some point. The x and y distribution, given m, well, we can uh, use the laws of probability to write the joint distribution of x and y as the probability of y given x and m times the probability of x given m. So that's a nice simplification because um, the physical relationship, the model, applies to these latent variables, the true values of x and y, not to the observed variables. So we have a deterministic relationship in the model between y and x, and that is that y is equal to mx. So this probability is a delta function, delta of y minus mx. So that's if in the model for given m, that is a deterministic relation, so this, is, uh, uh, this, this term is a delta. Prior on x has nothing to do with m. It's not a function of m, so uh, we just write that as p of, p of x. And then we can do the integral over y. We have this double integral to do. Well, the integral over y we can do trivially because we have a delta function, so that's very helpful, which gives us the posterior for m given the observed x and y uh, as this integral the likelihood of x and y given x and now because of the integration of the, uh, the uh, delta function y becomes mx here. So this is probably an x and y given x and a uh, y value of mx times the priors. Okay. So there it is again. So now we make some assumptions or we know what the error distribution is, so let's assume that uh, the error distributions for x and y are independent and Gaussian with unit variance, just to keep things simple. And we'll also take a uniform prior on x and n. So then we can write down that this probability, the x error distribution is just e to the minus half x minus little x squared, similarly for y, um, but notice that the essential value of y is so it's y minus mx. Okay. That's an integral you can do, it's just a Gaussian integral for x, so if you can square and so on, you can do that. Uh, and you end up with this analytic expression for, for uh, the posterior for m. <coughs> the observed values of x and y. 
That's what it looks like. If you have x equals 10 and y equals 15, then this is what you learn about the, the, the slope. Um, and, uh, sorry, this is that's a little x here. So, it's, so what this is, sorry, is the joint distribution of m and x before you marginalize over x. So it's it's actually this this quantity in the, in the integrand. So if you want p of x, you would then marginalize over the the unknown true value of x. So if you marginalize over So you can see that by breaking down the problem, introducing the latent variables, which are the ones that, where the physics is, you can, uh, you can then uh, write down these um, distributions and integrate them. Yeah? Why was m dot x dot m? No, sorry. Why was x dot m, right? Why was x? Xm. Xm. Uh, here. Because... Uh, So this, this has a typeset very well. This is actually a lowercase x. Oh, so the true value of x, sorry, the measured value of x is, uh, is 10. We don't know what the true value of x is because of the error. If you were to marginalize over n, then you would get, if you wanted it, the probability distribution for the true value of x. It's a, sorry, it doesn't typeset very well. I haven't typeset it very well. Let's just see how, this is a simple example that we can do analytically, but let's see if you had a more complicated situation, how we could uh, uh, use some of the techniques which we've learned about to sample from this distribution. So for a more complicated case, you wouldn't be able to do it analytically. Let's see how we could do some Gibson, and we could do MCMC with this as well. Um, if we take fixed x, say, then the probability for n given x, y, and little x is just the error distribution for, uh, for the x and y points. So if we fix x and just look at the n dependence of this, so we regard this as a function of n. So a fixed little x, we have this joint distribution here. Uh, we don't know what x is, but if we want to sample from it, and if we have a point here, say, and we want to draw a sample of x given of n, given little x, then we need to know the distribution along here. Uh, so the function, functional dependence on n is just through this mx squared here, which we can write in a Gaussian form just by rearranging this a little bit as e to the minus x squared over to m minus big y over to x squared. In other words, if we want to draw a sample of n for a given x, from here, we could draw one just by drawing from a normal distribution with a mean which is given by y over x and a variance which is given by 1 over x squared. Okay, so we can write down the conditional distribution of n given the value of little x. So we could do a Gibbs sample drawing there. If we wanted to then do uh, draw another point, we could then draw a sample of uh, little x given m. And then if you rearrange this uh, as a function of little x, then you'll find that you need to draw x from another normal distribution with a mean which is given by this thing here, and a variance which is 1 over 1 plus m squared. So you see that in this, in this case, we can write down the conditional distributions, and we could then do Gibbs sampling. Or if you prefer, you can take the whole thing and do MCMC and reject points depending on the values as you move around here. So whatever your sample, favorite sampling is, but this one would be good for the Gibbs sample. So here's the results of a Gibbs sample, um, and uh, so it works quite nicely. Okay, let me finish by, so that gives you the idea of basic hierarchical models where you, you divide the, the problem into steps. Let me just show you the sorts of things we do with, uh, with weak lensing data and show you the, the, the hierarchical model that we, that we have. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, we've basically divided the problem into steps. I'm not going to go through the details here, but uh, the, the two elements that we're trying to, to get out of it are the, uh, the power spectrum of the, of the map, which is C. Uh, we also want to get the map itself, so the, the 
Shia Hatton map, which is, which is S. So we have a Bayesian hierarchical model which uh, looks like this. There's a nice technique which is called Bessinger Fields, which allows us to uh, do this problem we can do, do otherwise uh, because of the noise properties of the, uh, of the problem that we have. I won't go through the details here, but this is, this is the Bayesian hierarchical model. The advantage of it is that we know what these conditional distributions are. So we've written this very complicated posterior in terms of elements, uh, conditional distributions that we know. Very similar to the last toy problem that we did. So um, it uh, breaks down quite nicely. Uh, so these are some of the samples that we draw. So just to maybe just concentrate on the top line here. So this is the distortion map due to weak lensing. It's one particular element of the distortion. I won't go into details, but that's why it looks a bit strange. It's as though the distortions are along the axes. It's just a, one component of the distortion. So this is a simulated data. This is the, the simulated shear map. Uh, we then make the data noisy because the shapes uh, have rounded elements. Um, and then we mask out some of the data because of bright stars, say. So that's the data that we start with. Um, and we draw samples from the posterior using the Bayesian hierarchical model where we jointly sample from the power spectrum and the map. Uh, so the map here has, I think this particular panel has uh, something like 15,000 pixels in it. Each of those the true values of the shear it a, it, uh, are all parameters in the model. We have a couple of slices, we also have D and B modes, so it ends up being about 70,000 parameters. So we're working with a large dimensional space. But the advantage of the Bayesian hierarchical model is that, the, uh, is that we know what the distributions of the, uh, the conditional distributions are. So given a power spectrum, we know what the probability of getting a particular map is. So we break it down into uh, probabilities that we know. So we draw samples. These are the samples that we have. Uh, we draw about 4 million of these to get decent convergence. So these are all possible maps, shear maps, true shear maps, which are consistent with the, uh, with the observed noise of data. Um, if you want, you can average them and get an average map. I wouldn't necessarily recommend if you do. It's not clear that it's, uh, uh, it's really the useful thing. What you, what you have is the as the output really is the posterior distributions of the maps and, uh, and the power spectrum. So the variance, if you look at the variance of the posterior, then it's pretty uniform across the field, except where you have mask regions, where the variance is large. So you might be surprised that the variance is not infinite. We do get some information in the, from the mask region. And that is because we're assuming a model where there's a power spectrum involved. So we're generating the power spectrum effectively as we're generating Fourier coefficients. Uh, so the true map, we know something about what's, what's in here, so the, the, these, what's in here is not arbitrary because it's made up of uh, Fourier coefficients uh, that we get some information about the amplitudes and phases of the Fourier coefficients. Um, so we draw samples from the map, so that's what, we, what I've shown you there. We also draw samples from the, uh, from the power spectrum, so these are, I'll just, just concentrate on this one here, as a function of of L is the samples of the power spectrum. Uh, the true power spectrum in the simulation is the red line and the, these bands with the 68% and so on uh, uh, credibility intervals for the, uh, for the power spectrum. Uh, so we can do a really quite, quite complicated inference problem in a 70,000 dimensional space uh, using these techniques. Uh, we do it both with Gibbs sampling and we also do it with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And those are both effective for, for, for this problem, despite the large dimensionality. Just to say that uh, you can extend this to really quite complicated uh, models where we've modeled as much as we can about the data. So every, what I've done so far is to, to show you the Bayesian hierarchical model that includes only the cosmology elements. But there are many other elements in a weak lensing uh, uh, survey that include things like um, shape measurement errors. So you could take as the data the raw pixel data. We've taken as the data the 
estimated shapes. Uh, there's photometric redshift errors and so on. So what you can do is to build a, a more complicated Bayesian hierarchical model that includes, say, the photometric redshift distributions as well. So you can sample from the photometric redshifts, or sample from the true redshifts, given the photometric redshift, uh, uh, given the uh, measured photometric redshifts or the posteriors on the uh, uh, on, on, on the redshift. Uh, so in principle, you can build a very complex model that includes all of the physical effects. The advantage of doing it is that all of the errors get propagated fully to the solutions. So errors in the photometric redshifts uh, can then get propagated right all the way back to cosmology. And that's not normally done at the moment. Those, those errors would not be properly included in the final analysis. We haven't built this basic hierarchical model yet. We might do it with a complex piece, but we can play it. So just to conclude, with these basic hierarchical models, sample posterior probability density. So just to remind you that that's, that's really the thing that you want in the basic way out of an experiment. The result of it is the posterior probability density. That's the result. Uh, you may uh, simplify it into a mean value of parameters if you want to make an estimate, but actually this is the object, which is the natural result. Um, break problem into steps with known or unknown conditional probabilities. If you don't know the conditional probabilities, then you'll have to make some assumptions, some priors for those distributions, which you then you, you then need to test that your uh, inference is not uh, sensitive to those priors. In this case, we know what, what the distributions are. Sample with gives for HMC. Very large parameter spaces can be done. And this has been done for supernovae. You could do a Bayesian hierarchical model very straightforwardly with the data that you've been using um, today, and that's been, uh, been done in recent years. Uh, interestingly, the results that come out of the recent analysis are actually quite different from the standard analysis, getting quite different parameter inferences. You can be more ambitious and do this in fully three dimensions. Um, so I've given you a sort of two dimensions, but a number of slices of two dimensions, which is what we do in lensing. In 3D, it's a more ambitious program because you have many more data. But that has been done, including by Metin here. Um, and uh, so that's also an emerging uh, field. And uh, I, what I would say is that this is not the first modeling that you would do with data, because it's slow. Uh, it's a supercomputer job if you want to do it for future surveys. Um, but I would say it's probably the last one that you'll do because it's the principal basic way to do things. All right, I'm going to stop there. Any questions on that before I hand over to you? So, uh, no. Um, if, if there are correlations in the data, you build those in. Um, so, in this particular example, it, the reason that it's feasible is that the shape noise is in fact independent from one pixel to another. But there is independence. Um, in principle, if you uh, if you know what correlations are, you just build them into the model. For this sort of size of dimensional dimension of parameter space, it becomes very challenging if you do have those correlations. Possibly impractical, I'm not sure. But in terms of the, the principles, yes, you just include them. Anything else? Okay.